Welcome back to The Pulse. My name is Matt. This is Crypto Heartbeat. Welcome back. It is Stephen Friday once again. And folks, this is exciting. You know why? Because everybody needs a friend. You know that? Everybody needs a friend. Why do we need a friend? Because we need to be encouraged. And I'm here to do that. And Steve has been there to do it. And Ray's always there to do it. And you know who is here to do it today? It's Mike Ostell. He is here to do it as well. Mike, it is so great to have you on the stream I emphasize friendship, and we'll get back to Mike here in a second, because, you know, there's a there's an amazing thing that happens. It's like this cord of str three strands, right? The strength that we have together in community. We weren't meant to be isolated. We were meant to be uh, together in community. And the power of that community is so big. And so today, a big part of what I want to talk about is how helpful Steve has been to me, um, but how helpful you can be to others. And just what that really means is we journey together um, as we listen and follow the living Jesus. So welcome back to The Pulse. This is going to be another Stephen Friday. What's up, Steve? Hello, I my friend. I caught you mid-drink. You did. What's up, man? You did. Well, same old, same old. We, yeah. uh, As we were talking in the green, green room, I got a chance to go have lunch with my granddaughter for Grandparents' Day. Wow. And um, love being a grandparent. Quite, I haven't quite figured out how I got there. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, I'm here. You're there. <laughs> and, we, and we had a great time being grandpa and uh, grandma today. That's, uh, that's fine. So it was fun. <laughs> that's awesome. That is awesome. Well, I'm, I'm excited and, and really thankful to talk to you today. We've been talking offline as we do. And it's been an exciting past couple of days that we'll share with everybody. But I, I first and foremost want to give a shout out to Mike Ostell. He says, hi, everyone. This group means so much to me. I might not last long today when those docs say rest. They mean rest. <laughs> you know, you've been you've been tracking with Mike. It's so good to have you here in the chat. And we just want to I just want to like I want to encourage you. I want to I want to tell you how much we care about you and, and just be you know bearing burdens with you we're with you you're not alone right on right on right on so any 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 uh comments to, to mike well just that you know mike is one of those authentic people yeah you know he he started um Taryn was another one I th am yeah. i pronouncing his yeah, name Aaron. correctly yeah. Yeah. he was another one early on that was saying hey uh I don't know if this thing is really real. I want it to be, you know, I'm looking, everything I'm doing isn't getting there. And now Mike is one of those guys that's saying, who's doing exactly what you have encouraged the folks to do and, you know, try it on for size and see how it works and see if Jesus is the real deal. And Mike is one of those guys that says, man, is he the real deal or what? Yeah. And so he's, um, it's been a lot of fun, uh, to get to know Mike and um, glad that he is uh, doing what he's supposed to be doing because when he's resting, he's not trying to be a hero. He's just doing what he's doing to get healthy. And, yeah. and that's the way to go. Yeah. So good yeah. job, Mike. Well, and, and you think of challenges in our lives that come in many forms, right? And obviously Mike, this is one of those things where it's like, Hey, get in here for open heart surgery. You know, that's, that's about as serious as it gets. Yeah, and to see you on the other side of it and to see you in the chat. And I know that you've been having challenges with walking and stuff like that. And, 
you know, I think as we exchange wishes with the one who created it all, that he uses these things in our lives in, in such a beautiful way is to think that what a, to think that open heart surgery would be a gift is is a almost crazy talk in in the upside down world. But in the right side up world, you, you think about it and you're saying, all right, the sovereignty of God over all things and to think that he redeems everything. Yeah, and that's what I right. love about no matter what it is. And so, Mike, it's so great to have you here. Tank Crypto, giving God all the glory, period. What's up, brother? Mm -hmm. We got Bearded Saint in the house, uh, Sam Kem. Brother Mike, good to see you here. We'll only be here for a few minutes. We'll have to watch the rerun this evening. Great to have you here. Thanks for stopping in. David Lee, the guy who traveled seven and a half hours to my dad's funeral. Mm -hmm. What's up, buddy? Um, old Drippy's in the house. What is going on? Um and Taryn, yep, there he is. Yep, there I'll he catch is. you in the replay. Be blessed all. Hey, thanks for stopping in and saying hello. We're on episode 20. Yeah, wow. Can you believe that? At least 40 hours we're going to have of content together of just a couple of guys, you know, talking about Jesus. And, you know, one of the things that's cool is <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a journey, right? I mean, it's a journey that's not meant to be done alone. I, I, I've recognized that. Um I just wanted to share something that, that we talked about and just kick things off with this, because I think what I was dealing with yesterday, Steve, is very common, right? I don't think this yeah. is like, you know, exclusive to me, but I just want to share this and vocalize this because I think this is where a lot of people find themselves. You know, I feel like in my life since at least September 10th of 2000, which, you know, I'm coming up on 23 years of doing this shindig here is you know, I've had these moments in my life where I felt like really Jesus inserted himself into a situation and was like, hey, stop, go do this, turn around, pay attention, right? And it was like it cut through the noise. And I was really thankful for that because it I used to describe it as God winking at me. He's like, yeah. oh, he's reminding me he's there, right? Well, it wasn't until I met you and really started wrestling with this idea and seeing things for what they were, right? It's like, I think I treated, I used that term, the veil a lot previously that he would kind of poke his head in on things once in a while and kind of intervene at times. And I was thankful that he did. And it was amazing, almost addictive to have those experiences. But I think it wasn't until, you know, we had these conversations to understand, all right, who are we in him, right? Who are you actually, who are you created to be and why did he create this whole thing? And then this idea that Jesus is alive and he speaks. And so much of what you said, you know, played out, right? I'd go to church and I'm like, people are telling me, you know, we're, we're talking about the past tense Jesus. We're, we're looking at the Bible, which is fantastic, right? And we're learning these things. And I'm like, this is true. But I think what dawned on me, and I continue to reflect on this, is the fact that everything that we've ever documented about Jesus is something he did or spoke. And it's interesting how all the reinforcement in the scriptures are things like, hey, listen to him, or the Holy Spirit is here so that he reminds you of everything I said. And he even said, I don't do anything unless the Father tells me to, because I and the Father are one. And so he's modeling this behavior of us being one that says, hey, you can come to me. Well, what I kind of was taught, and it wasn't directly taught, Steve, is that Jesus was a really good guy. He was, and he did some really great stuff. And it's almost like they they separated Jesus from like this, the, like the spirit, right? And it was like you you peeled them apart. Jesus is you know a historic guy, and then well, the spirit kind of did some cool things, and it almost like it continued to push Jesus into the background. Yeah. And then we could talk about God in general, but you know maybe on Easter Sunday we would say. Hey, brother, he's alive, you know, Woo -hoo, he's risen. And what I think is really amazing is that you shared this past, present, future idea is that people are happy about talking about Jesus in the past, and they're happy about talking about what might the future look like of his return, for example. But there's just not a lot of detail on how do we do this thing in the present? How yeah. do we do this thing of life? Because that's how we experience everything is in the now. How do we deal with it? And and, you know, you're like, hey, why don't you ask him? And that's been like the most consistent advice you've given me <laughs> over this time. And it's been the greatest advice possible. And what I love about this for anybody that's skeptical is to say the only thing Steve's ever challenged me with is to say you can ask him yourself. 
And I think that is one of the most powerful things you could possibly do. And so yesterday I was dealing with a major challenge in the sense that I was like, Steve, it's like the spirits are picking at me and wanting me to draw me off sides. And it's like everything is, you know, upside down and it's confusion and distraction. And, and I'm hearing essentially all these things are like, man, you're just wasting your time. You're spinning your wheels. You're an idiot. You're a, you know, all the stuff that's degrading to who I am. And I'm listening to this going, man, yeah, maybe I should just give up. Right. This is just, wow. Maybe I've just been, I've just been believing something that is just, you know, this is just in my head kind of thing. And I asked you, I said, you know, I was standing at, or I was stopping at a stoplight and I won't go into the specifics of this, but the term that, that Jesus gave me was that this thing that I was dealing with was like a red herring. And I said to you, I said, Steve, you know, I, I heard this and I felt like, wow, this is really out of the ordinary, right? That That's not a term that's often used. And I was describing that to Jesus speaking to me. And I said, how do I know? How do I know when he speaks to me? I, I was like, Steve, he doesn't like talk. Like, I don't hear him say, turn left here. You know, I, I, and you had an amazing response to me that I think is really important that everyone hears because as I'm journeying in this, even for 23 years, I'm still in this challenge of going, all right, how do I discern what is true and how do I discern when it is Jesus's voice, right? Yeah. How do I do this thing in the present, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a fun conversation yesterday. And to see the difference uh, <laughs> between yesterday and today, is, it's, it's just one, how it is, right? Yeah, it's yeah. just how it is. Um, well, there are a number of things that we talked about, but let's, let's start with the concept of discerning. Yeah. Because anybody who has spent any time, you know, in the Christian community, if you spend any time in the church, if you um, spent any time listening to, um, you know, preaching or gone to Sunday, it doesn't matter. Discernment is a really big thing. Um, and in my particular experience, uh, it's like one of those words that's really important and you know it's really important, but only a very few actually possess the ability to discern. And yet there's an obligation that is placed on everybody to be able to discern. So it's one of these really, really strange concepts that has a lot of potential meaning, very little practical meaning. And so let's take just a second to look at this, this idea of discerning. Um, within fundamental uh, circles of the church, uh, Hebrews 5 is a really important uh, chapter because what it basically talks about is that, hey, we've been talking about this long enough that by now you guys ought to be able to be teachers of others about how this works, and yet you don't know anything about it. You still have to be taught about the, and most translations will have um, the elementary principles um, of the oracles of God. Uh, some kind of language about that. And then it talks about that, um, because you're just children in this, you only uh, are able to tolerate milk. But those who feast on milk, they, they cannot uh, handle the solid food, is the way it's described, um, which is reserved for the mature. And then it has this statement. Who, by way of practice, have their senses to discern good and evil. Hmm. Okay, so what happens inside the church when there is a discussion about that, there is an attempt to separate those who have the who are mature, who have possess this ability to discern, and those who don't. And typically what ends up happening is there is then a further discussion that translate that 
I want to say translate, that then assigns to the elementary principles of the oracles of God fundamental doctor, doctrinal positions and completely misses the entire point that what the Hebrew writer is, is talking about is, hey, listen, you can't get to the mature things of discerning unless you first get the first, and the word is principles, huh. okay, of the oracles of God. So now let's look at what principles of oracles of God are. Those words actually mean the fundamentals of the logos of God. Okay. Now utterance, now that word oracle actually means utterances. So before you can get to the mature things, you have to get this first fundamentals of the utterances of God. Now, I defy you to get line up a thousand pastors and ask them what the fundamentals are of the utterances of God. And they won't be able to tell you what, it, what, what those fundamentals are. And because they can't tell you what the fundamentals are, um, they can't tell you how to move into the real area and arena of discernment because they have been taught with all good intentions. So I'm not pointing the finger and saying, you dirty rats or any of that. This is how we've all been taught. Yeah, We've been taught that the fundamentals of the utterances of God have been reduced to a sequence of doctrinal positions. That right there is a misdirection. Yeah. That right there is an intention to that then indicates to you, hey, there is a very legitimate path to getting to the point where you learn to discern between good and evil. Wow. There is actually a path that Jesus takes me on that then the, the outcome of that will be that I'm able to discern. And that word discern is a really interesting word because it means to be able to distinguish between lookalikes. Now, we've kind of touched on these in yeah. various, very, you know, the previous uh, episodes. We've just kind of touched on it here and touched on it there. And apparently it's time for us to do more than just touch on it, but to get into it. So by way of somewhat of an introduction to your to your question, there are certain fundamentals about the utterances of God that we need to understand. One of those, uh, one of those fundamentals are that when God speaks, it comes out of the very essence of who he is. Another one of those fundamentals is that when he does speak, he speaks in two different manners, two different uh, types of words. One is a logos word that communicates and expresses concepts, ideas, philosophies of life that inherent within that Logos word is the very nature and character of the one who authors that word. So you see, for example, Jesus telling John, in, uh, who then writes in uh, the first chapter of John, in the beginning was the word. That's the Logos word. And this Logos word in, captured the entirety of the Father's ideas about what he wanted to create, the philosophy behind his creation, um, the objectives and intentions uh, in his creating, as well as then transferring to them, you know, to the word, his own nature and character. Oh, so that's why Peter says later on, we are born of an indestructible seed, Undes indestructible logos. See, because there is nothing in his logos that is even, even have a modicum of corruption in it. So there is nothing to cause it to disintegrate. 
Thus, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, my logos will never pass away. This logos is so powerful, it's able to distinguish between the, the joints and the marrow, between the thoughts and intentions of the heart. See, these are some of the fundamentals of the, um, of the logos of God, the utterance of God in the form of the logos, which, by the way, has its, this logos is life, and the life is light. It enables you to see. Wow. I think when I discern what's actually happening is I'm seeing because I'm distinguishing. So one of the fundamentals is of the utterances of God is understanding how the logos of God works, which, by the way, then becomes flesh and dwells among people. So this isn't supposed to just be some philosophical discussion. It is actually to take shape inside the human being both spiritually, mentally, and physically, emotionally. The entirety of the human is to then be captured by and saturated in the logos of God so that it can dwell among other people. That's the fundamental. That's, those are just a few of the fundamentals of the logos of God. But when was the last time you heard any of that talked about inside of a church service or inside of a religious meeting. Never. I've never heard that. You know, you know where I heard that? <laughs> By sitting down and talking to Jesus. Yeah. And him sitting down and saying, no, look, at this is how this works. Wow. You know? So that's the Logos God. That's the fun. That those are some of the utterances the fundamentals of the utterances of the logo side of God's word. The other is the, the rhema side of God's word, which is the spoken part. That's where Jesus says man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is the spoken part. Well, what are some of the fundamentals of the spoken utterances of God? Well, when he speaks them, um, they transfer authority because you're not operating on what you think about something. You're operating in response to, okay? One of the fundamentals of the, of the utterances of God in the Rhema side is that it transfers this little packet that we've talked about of atomic power called his faith. And that faith enables us to accomplish what he has spoken to us. The one of the fundamentals is that whatever God speaks, it's not impossible for him to accomplish. He will accomplish it exactly as he intends. What is another part of the fundamentals of this Rhema uh, word is that we cannot understand apart from it. We can surmise, we can conclude, we can construct and contrive, we can do all kinds of things, but we cannot understand a thing about God without his faith that has transferred us to us through his rhema spoken word. See, these are just a few of the, you know, of the fundamentals of the utterances of God. Now, can you imagine what would happen if everybody on this stream, everybody who was operating inside what they think is the body of Christ in the churches and things, if they understand, understood just the things I've shared in the last five minutes? I know. Let me tell you what. The planet would look very, very different. Okay? So... The Hebrew writer is talking about, look at you want to get to the real deal? You got to get in the game, boys. You, you got to start by letting Jesus teach you about the fundamentals of his utterances and how he speaks and what his father says to do and how that all works together. Start there. And when you start there, then practice what you have learned. By the way, that's what Mike is doing. Yeah. Mike was practicing. See, and what is what are the results? Wow, 
this thing is for real. You cannot tell me any differently. I have now experienced this. This is for real. Okay. okay. Now this word practicing. Now the next, what happens? The mature by reason of practice. Now what that word practice means is just exactly what we have talked about. Right? Uh, name one thing that you're good at that you didn't have to practice. I mean, even when a baby is born, they first start trying to breathe and they're screaming their heads off because they've never had this experience. But what happens? It starts kicking in, kicking in, kicking in. And before you know it, through re by reason, they start breathing effortless, effortlessly. Of course, they've got to be healthy, you know, pending no, you know, no diseased elements. But if they're healthy, they just breathe naturally. And by the way, we're doing it to we're doing it today. Yep. We're still doing it. And so this this idea of practicing, you practice to the point where it becomes an habitual part of your daily manner of living. So we've talked about things, we talked about crab walking. Right? Yeah, you do these things with real overt intention for a while exercising your physical and mental processes until it becomes second nature to you. That's what practicing looks like. You just keep practicing. And then what happens when you do? After a while, you start learning to distinguish between lookalikes. That's what discernment is. See, the powers of darkness approach us as if they are watermelons. And you can't distinguish between a good watermelon or a bad watermelon. They both look really, really good. And now they want to put you in a, in a guessing game. Well, that's what discernment of distinguishing between lookalikes is. You look at two watermelons that look exactly the same, and somehow you've been practiced to the point where you can dis distinguish the right one that's properly ripened and the one that's overly ripened or under ripened. And you can tell through the smell, through the touch, through the weight, through the, through the uh, timber in the, in the tone. I had a friend of mine who uh, he since passed, but he grew watermelons. He could go out there and he could point to a watermelon and say, that's the one you want. Now, how, how do you, what do you mean that's the one I want? He says, that's the one you want right there. He was never wrong. They were outstanding. Why? Because he spent 50 years practicing, see, handling these things, looking at them to the point where he could just look at them from a distance and tell exactly the one. Now, what did I have to do? He had to tend, then teach me back to the fundamentals. Well, Steve, what you want to do is you want to, first you want to do is you want to look for one that has, you know, the yellow bottom. You know the, the the sun the sun portion. You wanted to, you want that the next and so he would take me through the half a dozen steps to know how to distinguish between the lookalikes of the melons. Well, within my family, I'm a pretty good picker of melons because I practiced. Well, how would it, what would it be like to not just be pretty good at distinguishing between the lookalikes of melon, but between the spiritual powers that come to you and try to secure your authority from you. Wouldn't that be a handy skill to have? Well, I think it is. So this discernment doesn't happen just because you read about it in the Bible or preach about it. It be, happens because you get in the game and you're willing to accept the risks of the game, which are sometimes you're going to get your lunch handed to you. And yesterday you were getting your lunch handed to you a little bit. Yep. See? And so, okay, what is that about? Well, that's an indication that you're in the game. And when you're in the game, let me tell you what. Here's how this basically works. You have described how you have made a declaration before God and all of creation that he alone has the authority to speak to you. You have made that declaration. Well, all of heaven rejoices over that. All of hell says, prove it. 
ah, that's what you that's what you said, Matt. But now you're going to have to prove it that it's true. Oh, Matt. Oh, you've made this huge declaration, and yet you are afraid to assign something you have heard as coming from Jesus. How in the world can you declare that only he has authority to speak to you, and you're not even willing to say when it is he's spoken to you? Right. How's that work, Matt? Okay. And so this picking, and that's exactly what it is. It's this picking, it's this annoying, it's an agitation, and it's intention from the kingdom of God standpoint is to indicate to you that you're ready to go the next level. You're ready. The training that you've had in the past has prepared you for that portion of time going forward, but now it's time for you to be trained at a higher level because you're getting ready to go to the next level. And so from the kingdom standpoint, this is a really good thing because it's indicating that you have, you're now ready to take the next step. But from a human standpoint, it can be very aggravating. It can be very annoying. It can be um, frustrating. It can be all of those things. Um, and the intention of it is to say, okay, Matt, prove it. And the reason why they say that is, and part of our conversation yesterday, was that um, in the kingdom of darkness, they are all liars. And so they hear according to their nature, and their nature is, is as a liar. So when you say, Jesus, only you have authority to speak to me, they hear that as a lie. They hear it as something that is self-serving. They hear that as something that if you offer something better or create such grief in walking in it that you'll give it up. Why? Because they're liars. And so what they're going to do is they're going to require you to prove to them that what you said is actually true. Um, now, I said a lot of stuff here in, you know, in probably the last 15 or 20 minutes. So maybe I need to pause at this point and and uh, and let you take it. The I next love level. it, dude. All right. So I got a question for you. Okay. Who do you think? is the greatest baseball player of all time. Oh, wow. Who is the greatest baseball player of all time? Man, I just don't know how you get past Babe Ruth myself. Yeah. Uh, just, from a, just from a human standpoint, but yeah. Yeah, so Babe Ruth, <laughs> I, I would think Mickey Mantle would be one of up in the... Yeah. Would it be? Uh, um, here's what I just want to say to everybody that's watching this or will ever watch this. What you're seeing is a professional. And I, I sat there and I listened to that. And, and Steve, I'll tell you what, man, it is such an honor to have these conversations with you because what you broke down there, I mean, it's like seeing. You know, you, you talk about this a lot. You describe it as like breathing, right? And yeah, for you, it's like breathing, right? Because that's the beauty of this spoken word, right? This is this logos and this Rama. This is, this is what it is to you. And I think what's really great is this game analogy, right? And the reason I asked baseball is here you are, a professional baseball player, and you have, God knew that you would apply that same effort to him. Yeah. And I think it's so wonderful of a redeeming story because that's what God does, right? He uses yes. everything because he created these things in advance, right? So it's preparation. And, you know, you can even break down. And what I love about this is it's like infinite resolution. You know, there's math, Mendelbrot's fractal math is it, it continues to be the shape of what it was from the beginning and yeah. that you can dive deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And you still see the same shape. It's like the leaf looks like the tree and there's, that's a, a fundamental part of creation and it's true in us as well. And see here, here you are playing baseball in the backyard. Right. And he knew what he was creating and he knew, all right, here's going to be a guy I'm going to put him in the game. 
what I think is amazing, what you're, what you've done for me and what you just did, and it continues to impress upon me is that Jesus is not trying to hide the ball. If anything, he's been trying to expose the nature of the game. Yeah. And the more and more that I, I, I hear your encouragement, which is really, Hey, I've, I've spent the time crab walking this stuff out, you know, and you can come to him at any moment and you will drink milk first. And what's interesting is it's almost like when these things snap together, because if it's in gaming, it's leveling up. Right. And, you know, the expectation I think a lot of people have is their first time at bat. They're supposed to be able to hit the curveball or to, you know, knock it out of the park. And it's just not the case. And I think that this, this game analogy really works well because look at a guy like Oliver Anthony, which his name is actually Chris. Here's a guy who six months ago was in a drunken stupor. Right. And he had gotten, far, far away from anything and literally had this moment where he, he just basically said, you know, he would cast aside everything that he has thought and said, all right, Jesus, the, I'm going to make this about you. What do you want me to do? Yeah. And in what less than six months, he is in this position. And when I hear him speak, he was on um, Rogan. And then he was also on Jordan Peterson yesterday. And I literally hear Jesus speaking through him. I'm just like, how amazing. But that's the neat thing about this. I don't think that the, it should be discouraging to anyone that, oh, man, you just have to put in 45 years like Steve and maybe you'll get. No, 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 no. The point is what you talked about in Hebrews 5 there is this idea that, well, this is a part of how it works. Yeah. And, and what I love about what you have done for me and what I feel like I want to reflect back to you and to make real is this idea of truth is so probable yes. that it's infinitely deep. Yes. And if you're willing to be interested, which is, I think, uh, really a, a core fundamental, like, how do I approach this thing? Well, are you interested in it? Yeah. And I think about that. I look up at the number. There's a number in the left-hand corner of my screen, and it shows the time, and it shows the number of people. And sometimes I look at that number, and I'm like, oh, wow, that's unique. And then other times I'm like, man, I wish more people were watching this. And I think about that and I go, you know what? We're going to do this. We're going to keep, we're going to keep doing this. And here we are on episode 20. And the value that this is going to be there if somebody's interested, but that's just as Jesus is saying to us, I'm here if you're interested. And there's not more than that. And what I think is really great about this is, what is the church? What has the church done? And I think what does anyone do that is trying to create structure and preserve something, right? So think of an institution. You know, I was on the board of my kids' Christian school. Do I want it to continue? Yes. What are some of the fundamental things? Well, you got to take care of the place. Yeah. Well, and if you think about it, the good intentions of people, whether they were eating meat or not, want the thing. They they see that there's value here. And I think what is amazing is how renewing one person's interest really is. And you said this the other day, it doesn't matter what others will do. What will you do? And look at Oliver Anthony. It's like, what will you do? Well, maybe there's a, a, you know, a plan to all this. Well, of course there is. And so I just want to, I just want to, one, I want to thank you. But two, I also want to say, this is what's missing for me. This is what's missing is that things don't become technicolor until they are technicolor for you. Yeah. And so you can learn all about it. And I think there's a lot of people who, hey, I value this because, you know, my kids, it's, it's good for them, right? There's all kinds of reasons why, you know, being a part of the church is this, you know, important. But I, I've heard so many people say this, and it's so true, is that Jesus is meant to be... Um, directly accessed and the way he's created it you know i jokingly say that he decentralized all this right he's like hey i gotta go but i'm sending one who will remind you of everything i said and you know you think about this idea of what is the framework of creation well it's and it's an abundant seed right it's the seed and it does nothing if it sits on the shelf i have to take the seed and do something with it yeah. and sometimes i drop it and the birds come and take it but I, if i 
partner with God himself in the creation. And I till the soil and I plant the thing and, you know, there's water and sunlight. I partner with him and there's an abundance. Well, the same thing is true here with engaging with interest in him. There's so yeah. much benefit that is tied into this. But we have to recognize that it is a process that has joy at every turn and challenge. But a lot of times, the, the beauty of this is that why would I consider it pure joy when facing troubles of many kinds? Well, because it's through that that we grow to eat meat. Yeah. And so, you know, what you said earlier, and this is a thing I just was struck by, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We often attribute that, obviously, to Jesus in the flesh. But I was literally listening to you, and I said, that's exactly right. The word has become flesh in you, Steve. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it becomes flesh in each of us. Yes. And that's it, right? Like This idea, now when you think about the alignment in the right side up world, if we are created in his image and are conforming and, and growing into his likeness, then we would be him in the world to others. And that's what you are yes. to me. And so the word has become flesh. His name is Steve. Yeah. But Steve doesn't do anything unless the Lord Jesus says it. And it's just the exact model that he gave. And so the simplicity and the beauty of it is, is that it is, it's infinite in its, in its you know, resolution. It is eternal in its truth. And it's beautiful, right? It is right. It is true. It resonates. And so... I just want to thank you, Steve. And, and I want to just, I just want to read this to you because it just, it makes me laugh how all of these things come together. Second Corinthians 4, 18. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And I literally, I read that this morning and I literally, when you said this, you're like, well, what is discernment? Yeah. And you think about it. Well, if I'm judging between lookalikes well, I have to, I have direct access to the one who knows, who is called truth. Yeah. He knows which melon's ripe. <laughs> That's right. Are you interested in knowing that? Mm -hmm. And I saw that happen. I told you that story in the green room yeah. and everything. It's like, yeah. I knew it. I knew yes. which was the right <clears throat> path. And I knew which one. And, and that's something that um, is so encouraging about all of this stuff is... <clears throat> It doesn't make it hard for you to discern if you're interested and engage with him. Because you said this to me when I said, you know, I, I felt like he was saying it's a red herring, but I didn't know. And, and you said to me, he goes, well, why don't you ask him about that? I, you know, and, and what you said to me was, all right, Jesus, you know, I really feel like this is what you're saying, that this is a thing that is a distraction. And I might need to be cautious about avoiding this. Is that what you're saying? And I hadn't, you know, not that I hadn't thought about it, but. What an obvious thing to do. Well, I can engage with him more than one time. If he speaks one thing, I could probe him about that. I could ask him about it. I could converse and, and say, hey, is this what you're thinking? This is what I'm sensing. And you know what I love about it, Steve? I've had so many people in my life who were what I consider kind of holy roller people, right? They had flames on their van. And they're always got a word, right? They're like, brother, I got a word for you. And they're it's disingenuous. It's hokey. And it's, it's, it's just not true. And it, it's repulsive to me. Hmm. And you are the absolute antithesis of that. You, there's nothing about who you are and how you've communicated with me and how you've engaged with me that has ever been playing a hokey game of what Jesus might or might not say. Because all of these things, I, I just know, have been... You've worked through this process with him. You don't lightly say, Jesus said to me. And I see so many people that are, you know, well, I got a prophetic word for you. I, I'm like, let's talk later. Not interested, right? And what's really neat about what you have, you have um, impressed upon me is it all works together in alignment. It all fits the framework. There's nothing like out of joint. It's not like, well, well, that's really weird. Well, that doesn't fit in. The scriptures go against this, or that doesn't make any sense. No. If anything, it's making the picture more clear. And, you know, 
24 to 48 hours later, you see it blossom. You yeah. go, there's the evidence. There's the fruit. And in a way, if there wasn't that 72 hour rule, this stuff could be considered hokey. And you go, no, this is why Mike goes, I'm practicing it. I'm seeing it. Yes. And to think that it doesn't have to come along once in a while and poking his head through the veil, but that literally it could be just like breathing. It says to me, is everyone meant to be in the game, Steve? Well, everyone is invited into the yeah. game and everyone is equipped to participate in the game. But included in those two elements is everyone also possesses the sovereign authority to choose to participate or not. And That's that right. and that right there is what distinguishes it all. You know, that one of the, one of the great ahas that happens is when uh, Jesus starts to bring you into what liberty and freedom and choice actually looks like to him and why he created it and why this very sometimes complex appearing plan that he put in place. Why did you do all of that when you could have done something very simple? Okay. And I mean, I remember one time just, you know, by way of example, <clears throat> I was talking to him one morning and I said, you know, and I was really getting frustrated with all of the, the confusion and antagonism and resistance and all the picky any stuff that happens that he does, you know, that, you know, the spirits of darkness do it just part of their makeup. And I said, you know, you know, Jesus, we, we could end this today if you would just get Satan saved. <laughs> if you just saved the dude, this thing yeah. would be over tomorrow. Let's, let's do that. <laughs> and it was, you know, of course, that was back into some of my, in my earlier days of, and I still had a, had an, uh, a more religious understanding of what saving and salvation meant. And so to me, it was just getting him to confess Jesus as Lord and all of that stuff. And it was, no, he confesses me as Lord and he will bow as Lord. But that time is not yet. He has, he has executed his choice. And I will not infringe on his choice. You know, so there's a lot of directions we could go even with that. The unpardonable yeah. sin concept. Well, what's the yeah. unpar unpardonable sin? Well, it's it's it is the choice, the intention, the choice of intention to live your life apart from God. There is no basis for forgiveness of that. There is no basis of redemption because that is a choice. That is a sovereign choice. And so there is no mechanism to undo that except another choice. And so, you know, it's very, very, it's very, very powerful. Um, but if we can, by the way, Matt, I appreciate some of those, some of those kind words and I, they mean a lot to me. So thank you for that. Um, the, so now let's look at this idea. You, had, you first asked me about discernment. So that's the concept of discernment. Now let's talk about this idea of practice. Okay. <clears throat> what does practice imply? If you're going to practice something, what does that imply? Repetition. Okay. Repetition. You're going to do it over and over, over again. And when you start doing it, What's your level of success? Probably very little. Ah, very little. So one of the fundamentals of practice is the understanding that there is failure in the practice. That's why you're practicing. Yep, to get better. Ah, see? And the idea is not to get to perfect um, execution, 
because you are always growing. To, to imply perfect execution is to imply total completion, that you have arrived at the ultimate state of completion. Well, we are, we are not. God himself is the ultimate state, you know, standing of completion. And so we are constantly growing into him. And that's why there's this thing called eternity, because it's going to take forever and unending time to do that. And so we can kind of even get into some more, you know, structural kinds of things about the role that, that choice plays in the idea of eternity. And then how that distinguishes the, the capabilities of God as distinct from all other created beings. He can handle that infinite, you know, um, infinite possibility of choices and the impacts and results that they produce because he himself is the essence of eternity. So it, it poses no issue to him, while for us it, it provides an opportunity for great learning and experience and maturing. So that all comes out of choice. And by the way, we can look at that in our own, in our own life. You know, how many of us I had a friend of mine um, and he was regretting some of the choices he made in his, you know, in his, over the course of his life. And this is a really faithful guy. I mean, this is a guy that does not have one ill intent in his makeup and everything he has intended to do his entire life, as far as I have known him has been to do exactly what he thought God was asking him to, to do. He, is an, he was an example of somebody who was attempting with everything in him to be faithful, to be full of faith. And yet he was looking over the course of his life with some regret and making some bad choices and things like that. And so I just shared with him um, what Jesus shared with me when I went through, was going through one of those episodes in my life. Because who among us can look back on our lives and say every one of our choices was a good one. Right. See, if we take any time to look back, we say, man, we made a whole lot of really lousy choices in our lives. You know, well, what did those choices produce? Well, in his instance, he was looking back at a lot of those with regret as if he was a foolish man. And so I, again, I just said to him, well, here's what Jesus shared with me when I went through, was going through one of those times. And he said, Steve, take a look at all of the great things that are happening in your life. And Matt, there's a bunch of them. See, I mean, I am a blessed man. Um, God has blessed, blessed me abundantly in the areas of life that mean something. Yeah. Okay. Now there are a lot of areas that, Hey, in areas that are temporal, that don't mean a lot that are a pain in my butt. Um, but in terms of the things that really matter in life, God has blessed me abundantly. I'm a wealthy man in those areas. And so Jesus said, which one of those would you give up in order to change what you regret in the past? And I thought, well, wait a minute, what, what, what does that have to do with that? Well, because if you change that, you change this. Mm -hmm. And what I realized was I look back over my past with regret because I want to change things and I fail to see in the present. Oh, there's that present idea again. Yep. I forget what's happening in the present that has with all of the astounding blessings that are surrounding my life and I forget about those only to look back at the things that I regret not recognizing okay Steve if you change that you change this are you willing to change something that is beautiful to you now in order to change the thing that you have regret about in the past and I said no Lord I don't he said, there you go. All that you have lived has produced where you are today. 
And so all has contributed to this great blessing that you recognize in your life. I instantly stopped looking back at my past with regret. Yeah. Because I saw it in the context of discernment. Yeah. See, I saw it as he saw it. And the lookalikes that were saying, hey, if you change this, you can have both what you have plus something better. That isn't the, that was the lie. The truth was, it was all producing where we are today. And so if you regret, regret your life today, then, hey, talk to the guy who helped get you where you are today and maybe see it from a different point of view. Well, that's a different point of view. I mean, that's a huge portion of this. You know, Ray and I went to my son's football game. We traveled two hours. Why they have, you know, middle school kids going two hours to a game it was 105 and Ray hung out with me at my son's football game, which is so what nice friend. to do. He is a, he is the, the man he's sitting over here right now. And we had just a, a really great conversation. And you know, what came out of that conversation was what you're saying here. You know, there's so many things that, and we equated the, the spirits of darkness, right? We, we, we kind of equated it to, um, Ray's always said he's a he's an engineering kind of guy. And he always has said, what if we could see radio waves? Right. So mm -hmm. think about this. Let's just think about every station, every radio station, every Wi-Fi, every cell phone, everything that communicates, you know, radio frequency. And if you could actually see it, it would be like looking through moving spaghetti, like literally mm -hmm. everywhere around us we would see it. You'd look at a Wi-Fi router and you'd see stuff emitting out of it. Your phone would be going crazy with, with this RF frequency. We'd, every radio station, television, all of these things, and things you don't even know, your microwave oven to every electronic device, and it would be unbearable. And potentially, if you could see it all, you couldn't see through it. Yeah. And we were, we were using that as a metaphor for almost being... Um, saturated in this world with constant bombardment of distraction. Yeah. And that, you know, what's the goal of this stuff? And one of the things that we were reflecting on was the fact that our friendship is one in which we remind each other of the blessing of God. Yeah. Right. That, that part of our role in each other's lives is to say, Hey man, man, how are your kids doing? Oh man, they're doing great. Oh, man. You know, it's these things of this reminder to say, hold on a second. So the spirits want me to focus on all of these things that are wrong, the yeah. regrets, the the difficulties, all of these things. And, you know, I think about this, you know, verse of fixing your eyes upon Jesus. Right. Yeah. What does it mean to do that? And I think I always think about the, the thief on the cross. You know, just imagine what gets you next to Jesus on a cross, right? That was the way you killed people, right? Tortured them to death. And here is one who looks at him. And, you know, you think about this. It's just so amazing how everything fits into this framework. He looks upon Jesus, right? And what is it? I mean, he recognizes who he is. Yeah. And I think about this spoken word of Jesus, Right. Like here's a guy nailed onto a cross next to him and Jesus speaks to him. The living Jesus in the moment speaks to him and says, today you will be with me in paradise. Yeah. And I think about that amazing thing. Right. Possibly this criminal had some things he regretted in his life. <laughs> and to think that Jesus's spoken word supersedes anything that could have happened previously. And to yeah. think that there's so many stories of unequal, you know, um, and I don't know, blessing, unequal um, um, wages, right? Well, we've been working all day and you only worked for an hour. Yeah. And you just think about this in the framework and you go, okay, we've got to constantly remind ourselves. Um, and, and, you know, I, I've even seen this in people that you would expect to be the most downtrodden. I had a buddy I've told you about who had colon cancer and he went through 75 rounds of chemo. Wow. And he would say to me, the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life is getting cancer. And I'm like, 
you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. I mean, you've vomited for the last, you know, 75 weeks or whatever it is. And it's like, really? And he's like, yeah, it's just the perspective that he has gained out of this for appreciating, you know, all of these things that are blessings. And so I just feel like a real heart for, you know, Mike Ostell, right? Anyone yeah. or someone that's out there who is, you know, there's this Wi-Fi that's bombarding us, right? We're saturated with these lies. And it's a constant battle, it seems, to convince you that you're worthless, that you're not. And, you know, this whole this whole 20 part series that we've done on right side up, the whole point of it being is that it's upside down. Yeah. And I think what's so amazing about that concept of upside down, right side up is that upside down is a complete lie. It's backwards to how it's supposed to be. And when you think about this, everything that you've talked about of when things get turned right side up, they are ordered correctly. And yes. what are you saying? You're saying, hey, if you really take stock and have the right perspective, well, what does Jesus provide you with? Uh, the truth, the way, <laughs> the life, the light. And you go, oh, now I can see, and now I can discern between these things. I can see when these things are lying to me. I can see when this is faulty fruit. And so you're going to lead me in the way everlasting. What? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That is incredible. So, so no wonder you say, do not lean on your own understandings. And we don't look at the things that are seen. No, no, it's the things that are unseen. And so give us eyes because, you know, what is amazing, you said, is that there's two sides of this coin. We are operating in the physical and in the spiritual. We yeah. just don't see the spiritual. And that's what Jesus provides us with is the ability to see the unseen. But it is subtle and it requires interest and it takes practice. Yes. But boy, the fruit of that is just, it's custom tailored for you. This adventure of life is custom tailored, whether you go through open heart surgery or not. Well, the, and you just said it. You, you start entering into the, the dimension of life that was intended. Yeah, that's it. It is still very available. I mean, it's, it's not hocus pocus stuff. It's not based on ritual. It's not based on doctrine. It's not, it's based on one thing and one thing alone an interest in having a relationship with the guy who built the whole thing. Amen. Amen. You know, and it's, a sentence. There it is. It, and it's, it's some total. You know, it's funny is I literally had this picture in my mind. I said, I was, yeah, it was like, you have to ask Steve this. Have you ever turned the wrong way on a one way street? I've done that once a, a couple of times, and I've seen other people do it. Have you ever done that? Uh, yes, I've, I've grown up in big cities, so more than once. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think everyone's kind of experienced this. You know, that feeling is like when you re realize, hold on, all the cars are facing my way. And I was thinking about that as it relates to this. You can drive the wrong way on a one way, yeah. you can. Yeah. potentially for a while. And it seems like, you know, this whole upside down world thing is that there is a way. And I love that Jesus was described as the way. Yeah. Because right the way, the way is like, Hey, it, it moves. It has a trajectory. It has a timetable. It has a path and it, it moves forward. It has momentum. And to think that, Hey, he's given you the ability that you can swim upstream if you want. You can drive backwards on the one way, but think about what, what does it look like? What are the benefits? And there are a tremendous amount of benefits to say, Hey, what is the right way to go? Yeah. You know, and I feel like it's so accessible. And I, I said that, that to you last time, you have made Jesus more accessible because you're not putting up barriers to say, all you have to be is interested you know, and I think that because we've created this transactional nature of Jesus, we said, you have to get saved. Well, you know, when I was 12, the, the church lady was like pressuring me to do this. And so to shut her up, I did it. <laughs> right. I'm like, get off my back, lady. 
and and they're like, oh, your life's going to be all different, all this stuff. And I'm like, no, you forced me to do this. This is for you, not for me. And to think that, you know, I was 12 then and it was what? I was 28 when it like really hit me. And I really had this like experience of going, no, this is a real deal. And I think that that's the thing that's absolutely amazing is whereas I had this experience that was my own and it was Jesus entering in and saying, hey, and it was like a thousand pounds lifted off my back. But I'll tell you what, everybody wanted me to to pray that prayer and do that thing. And they wanted to. And that was for them. And what I love about this is to me, this is the purity of the gospel is to say that. Who is the father, but one who is a father? Yeah. And I think about my own kids. I'm like, I don't, I understand who they are. I, I, there is all kinds of um, leeway, if you will, because I understand that they're not, they don't have the experience that I have. And you're like, if I can understand that about my own kids, what is the father, the creator of all things willing to understand about us? And to yeah. think that, when you when you distill it down to you have a choice and he's going to respect that choice but how amazing if heaven rejoices when one is interested in coming to him and I, that's what's amazing to me is that we've reduced it to this transaction versus this transformational relationship yes and that to me is it's like um and i and i and i understand actually why it was done because people wanted to preserve the institution, but the institution isn't the person. And the person, the institution has, it's almost like it's, um, it's a, it's a lookalike in some respects, yeah. but absent of the one who created it, absent of the, 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 the purpose, the, the source, it's empty. And so many people, and that's the experience I had as a kid. It's like, no, you're, and, and that's the thing. You've never, ever communicated anything in a way that wanted to convince somebody of anything. It's like, no, I just, I've been asking these questions and you've given me an understanding of the framework. Try it on for size. Ask him yourself. He's been accessible to me and he says he's accessible to anyone who's interested. Well, yeah, you know, one of the, uh, one of the, you know, we say it all the time, but, you know, one of the, um, one of the statements made about insanity is uh, doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. Yeah. yeah. Well, why continue to do the same thing, you know, over, over and over and over again to produce the same results when we see the results are, are on their face sorely lacking. I mean, we had part of our conversation yesterday, you know, is that if, and it kind of ties into our stream last week about we've forgotten how to think about, we've forgotten how to think. Yeah. You know, we, we don't even know how to think anymore about stuff. We just regurgitate stuff. We become cause chas chasers. We, we do all kinds of things that we think are good. I don't know if anybody saw the you know, the uh, uh, U.S. Open the women's quarterfinals last last night, but some fervent young college kids went there to protest and some kid, you know, cemented his bare feet to the concrete in order to stay there protesting against, you know, corporations and fossil fuels and all of this kind of good stuff. Well, you know, that those kids are full of passion. They are full of enthusiasm for what they believe is true, but it's centered around a cause for which they have not one modicum of understanding that so inspires them that they will cement their bare feet to concrete. Now, will somebody please just stop for a moment and say, okay, what spirit is that? <laughs> I mean, take it out outside of the intellectual realm because it's 
crazy on its face. Now, to them, it's not crazy. It's trying to gain an audience, trying to gain attention, you know, but what they, because they don't have the experience, the majority of the attention is, dude, you just cemented your feet to the flipping concrete. Really? What do you think that was going to accomplish? Okay. Well, guess what? We've done exactly the same thing in this thing that we call the church. My intention is not to bash the church. It's to say, guys, stop and think for just a second. If Jesus is indeed the head of the church, and the church is as it says it's, uh, it, that it is, it's the body and bride of Christ. Talk about lookalikes. Is this the best that Jesus can do over 2,000 years? Is this the best he can produce over 2,000 years? Well, I'm here to say that he has gone a whole heck of a lot farther in 40 years of one man's life than what I see being demonstrated in an institution over two th nearly 2,000 years. So what? who is actually the head of that institution? Yeah. Okay. Now that is a hard question, but it's a legitimate question because it's part of the probing that says, okay, Jesus, if this is true. How do you see this? How do we probe this? How do we actually get to the place where we can see the, what, this thing the way that you see it? Not looking at what is purely, you know, on the, at the physical realm, but what's happening more inside the spiritual side of this thing. We are spiritual beings. How do we know that? Look at somebody who's dead. It, it takes no more, it's no more complicated than that. You know, something was inside that piece of clay, inside that machine that was animating it. When the animating element departed, guess what happened to the machine? Okay. You had that experience, you know, you've talked about that many, many times at a very personal level with your father. Yep. You know, my father just passed recently. So these are very fresh concepts and ideas and experiences that they have meaning if we will actually look at them, you know, and say, Jesus, what about that? How are you seeing that? That, by the way, is part of practicing. And when you practice, the implication of practicing is that you are going to fail along the way. Yep. And failure is not a problem. Failure is the very mechanism by which we learn and grow and gain experience and transition from being immature to mature. That's what practice does. And you can't be afraid of it. If you are, you can't get in the game. Because you have you have a competitor who is there to strike your butt out, yep. and to render you inoperable. If you're afraid of that, this is not the game for you. Okay? If you're not afraid of it, then check in with Jesus and say, "Hey, what about that? Is that yep. something I can participate in?" And then fasten your seatbelt because yep. he's got a he's got a place for you. He's got a position for you. You know, what's, you know what's amazing to me though, Steve, is you know what's funny is I I I'm I told you the story earlier what had happened, you know, this morning. Yes. And I have joy telling you. I'm like, hey, I gotta tell Steve about this because this is great, right? And what am I doing? I'm talking to a real person, yeah. right? That I talk to and I say, Hey Steve, man, look what Jesus did. And you're like, man, that's super cool, right? You you take joy in it as well. Right. Absolutely. I, I look at what we're doing here for 40 hours and I, I'm reflecting on what Jesus said about being and making disciples. I think about my life. I think back, who are the people that kind of built into me? Right. Hmm. Who are the people that like, took some time out and said, you know what? And you're one of these people, right? You're like, hey, um, in a way, if I'm interested, you're willing to talk, which, yeah. you know, that's effort. Like you're you're actually doing that. And I think about this idea of discipleship. 
and you know i think about that even with the friendship i have with ray i mean we are brothers in this but it's really really beneficial and helpful to be reminded and to to wrestle with these things as well together and that's obviously what we're doing here right we're just having these conversations but i think that there's something really there's something also knit into who we are that desires for someone who's got more experience you know a coach a mentor a you know somebody that you can you can go hey how how, how has this gone for you right and you see this in all the trades right you yeah. see this in in sports you see this in a lot of places it's like well if i want to get pro level i may need to have someone on the outside take a look at this thing and there's real value in that right and i really appreciate it you know you you naturally enjoy doing this but you're actually providing a tremendous service. And I think about that as it relates to Jesus's creation. Why did he yeah. create the way that he did it? And why did he say, and why, you know, and, and then I think back to, you know, the church, right. And, and we are pretty hard on the church. I, I have to admit, but it's, it's also not one thing. And I think that's really important for us to recognize, you know, there's so much fraction fractioning of our factions, right that it has been fractured yeah. and so many different people with different views and, and they're not all equal, certainly. But when I think about the ecclesia, right. And you, you're really helpful in going, let's look at what the word actually means. And you think about those that are called out ones. And I, and I think about so many times saying, um, um, I don't know you. Jesus actually saying, I don't know you. I don't recognize you. I don't know who you are. And in a way, those that chased after him and wanted to know what the what the parable was about, right? The agricultural story. And it's like he described those as those the called out ones, right? And I yes. think about that as it relates to discipleship and all this is what you're doing is you're saying, do you want to be in the game? I'm willing to talk with you. And what you're essentially saying is, hey, I, I'm willing to be your coach. And I look at what the, the universal church is, right? If there is truly, he is the head of, and, you know, this is, you know, the church is the bride of Christ, right? This, well, it still exists. It's just not what you think it is. Exactly. Right? It exists. Exactly. It's not that it's not there. And it's not that, it's just not what you think it is. Yeah. And I think a lot of times I've been trained to go, well, those people aren't real Christians or those people aren't real believers or those people aren't. And, you know, and I've, I've obviously gotten rid of that to say, I, I think about the, the toddler in Nepal. There's a toddler right now in Nepal, probably at about 12,000 feet above sea level yeah. and has been, yeah, I mean, it's a child who's four. I don't expect the child who is four that's growing up in that area with that culture and with those religious practices to be chatting with Jesus, yeah. but he created it all. And he sees that child the way he sees us. Yes. And I look at that and I go, well, you know what? What an amazing blessing that we have that we can be told and encouraged with, with this, with this truth, because it feels like to me, if he's willing to come after one of us, you know, the, the prodigal son, he's, he, he, he knows what he's doing. Yes. right. He on. knows what he's doing. And I just, I'm so thankful for you, but I think what would the church look like? You know, you were like, what would it be like if people actually, you know, listen to him? And there's something special going on here, Steve. I don't know what it means for the next 40 years. But what is so refreshing is what if we labored with Jesus about how to practice this thing? Yeah. What if we, we said, hey, how do you want me to be in the present? You know, and to think that, well, hey, I've given you all of these resources. I've given you all of these, you know, I'm going to remind you. I'm going to be with you. I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. And you can come to me at any point and discuss these things and I will show you how I see them. And what is that? What's the result of that? Oh, a straight path. 
okay, well, I want to go on a straight path. I don't want to drive backwards on the one way. And I think about what that alignment means. Well, it's more of true life in what it's intended to be. And so the big picture of all this is I feel called to this time as it relates to the money, hmm. but it's not just to the money. And we had yeah. this experience and I, I would love to kind of wrap up with this, um, this big idea. You said that he who controls the seed controls the economic order, yeah. right? So think about this. We're in this time of massive transition. You know, of course, this is a crypto channel and I talk most of the time about, you know, cryptocurrencies and people know that, hey, there's maybe some opportunity and I might be able to win. But what's coming and becoming more and more clear is that there is a transfer happening. And people in the secular world are saying, hey, this is the greatest wealth transfer in the history of. And they'll use demographics and say, hey, all these boomers and, and all of these things and but there's a spiritual transfer that is happening right now. And it seems to me like whatever it is that he has created you to be, there's more work to be done. And it's not effortless work, but it is meaningful work. Yes. And it's work that is assigned by him if you're willing to listen. Because I feel like if I use the road analogy, I've been hitting the median, I've been hitting the barriers back and forth and back and forth. And it's like, I go my own way and I run into something and it's like, no, no. All right. Are you interested? Okay. I'll make your path straight. And so what is discernment? What is discernment? Well, if I can judge between lookalikes, I'm going to avoid some traps. Yeah. And, and, and then, what is what is it? What do I read? I read that there's reward for this thing. Yeah. You know, you were saying, you know, some of these things are annoying, right? A pain in your butt. But then you look at the, all the blessings, you're like, these are the things that really matter. Yeah. And you're like, wow, that you are rich. And I think so many people right now are so interested in like, I got to get financial security. That's where it's at. And I just hate to break it to you. It's just not where it's at. But the beauty of this is we are in this time where the, the model is, is shifting and changing. But what is it for? And so would you share, I want to like tie two things together. Will you share the purpose of creation, right? In the sense of the kingdom. And how are listening to him and asking him and probing with him and being on a straight path, no matter what the assignment is, is real life. Yeah. There's, yeah. There, I know there's a two kind of concepts packed together, but I want to hear your, your thoughts on that. Because if we come back to the very core on earth as it is in heaven, why are we here? And, and what is our role? And how do I go about you know, having some milk to maybe have some meat and get in the game and be, be useful in partnering with the one who created it all. What's that? What's that? What's that like? Yeah. Well, think about it. Start where, you know, the earth um, as it is in heaven. So uh, as you, we've talked about in previous sessions and alluded here is that, you know, Jesus was coming out of a time of prayer exchanging wishes with the father and the language, the definitions in that verse um, describe and completing his time and being changed. So there, there was a visible evidence of Jesus being changed as a result of completing his time of exchanging wishes, i.e. praying with his father. And so the, one of his disciples tracked him down and said, hey, man, will you teach us how to pray? Hmm. Now, as we've talked about in the past, I don't think he was asking a mechanical question. I don't think he was asking the, about the procedure, uh, the mechanics, the ritual of praying. 
I think he was asking about how come when you pray, things happen beginning with you, and then out of you, things happen. Would you teach us about that? And so Jesus immediately then starts, starts taking him into the purpose, which was your first question. First of all, understanding who it is that you are appealing to. His name, authority, cause, and character are the most hallowed. Hallowed is the English word that's used. He is the most hallowed of all beings in creation. That's who you're talking about. That's who you are appealing. And the one that you're appealing to, he has a vision for why he created. And his vision is that his man would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. That is how heaven is ruled. And so when you pray and you exchange wishes, that's who you are praying to. And that is his mission in all things that he does. All of creation has been designed to accomplish that end. Oh, that's kind of that Isaiah verse. My word is like a seed. I sow it. I send it forth. It comes back to me and accomplishing the purpose for which I sent it. It will not return to me void. Oh, so that's what his intention is, is that we would rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. So that when you pray and exchange wishes, that is the fundamental, okay, of how you approach him. And then that his will would be done that his kingdom would come as in heaven, so also in the earth. So however it is that you might imagine that heaven is operating, the intention is that the earth would function exactly in that same way. Now, guess what? You want to be changed? Then okay, ask him how heaven functions. Ask him. Ask him to show you how heaven operates. And then as he shows you that, then you'll begin to understand what he means by his will being done on earth. Wow. Exactly as it operates in heaven. So let's kind of pull, let's kind of pull us, uh, back from that a bit. Are people wondering about wealth, wealth distribution in heaven? Like are, they con are they concerned with resources being pooled to create illusions of scarcity? Are they worried about somebody saying one thing and doing another? Go right down the list. No, heaven functions perfectly within the construct of how it was how creation was designed to function. Is there anybody in heaven out there doing his own thing? In other words, are there any entrepreneurs in heaven the way that we see them down here? By the way, you, you gave me some high compliments that are sometimes difficult to hear because they, they create, they illustrate the impact that Jesus is having in another life. Well, how did we come to get, how did we come together? See, but we could not have created that scenario. We could not have put those dynamics together. No. And the moment that um, you shook my hand, you described how Jesus said, listen to this man. Well, guess what you did? You operated exactly as heaven operates. Okay, let's do that, Jesus. And here we are, almost a year, 11 months down the road, into our 20th episode on here, 
And who in the world could have constructed what we have experienced together, even in that short period of time? That's how heaven works. That's how it functions. And its purpose is to accomplish the Father's vision, which is that as man would, would rule with him, rule all of his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. That's it. Well, why don't we learn how to do that? Jesus, will you teach me how to, how to rule with you in the fullness of your nature and character so that everything that I touch has truth in it? Everything that I do is full of truth. It has no decaying, corrupting elements in it. It is simply the way that heaven functions. Will you teach me how to do that? That's the purpose. That's the purpose for the kingdom. That is the purpose for creation. So that's the first, you know, that's the first, to me, that's the first answer. Learning how. That king, how that heaven functions, and then moving on from there. Well, I just and, imagine what the implications of ruling in his nature and character would be. What if his man did rule his institutions in his nature and character? What if there was only truth? That's what I th see as the implications of what this decentralized financial model, right? political power and financial power separating and that people having this opportunity, right? I can't go into the federal reserve and print money. I, I don't have this control and here, this thing, the tables are being turned over. The money changer tables are being turned over and it's this resetting that gives us this opportunity. The question is, will we rule in his nature and character? And it starts that with is, me, right? That's exactly right. It start, it starts with us answering that question Am I interested? If I'm not interested, then guess what I've chosen? What we have. Simple choice, not complicated, simple choice. But let's look at this, what you just described about, you know, finance and, you know, DeFi and things of that nature. You know, when, when Jehovah uh, conveyed to Moses the, the economic design that Israel was to operate within, he had one of these elements about uh, what are in the translations called weights and measures. Okay. And the, and the language is really quite fascinating apart from the, the, um, the, the translations of it, but just, you know, for, for brevity here, what Jehovah was telling him is that, listen, I absolutely am disgusted by differing weights and measures that you operate with. So when you go out, you can't, you can't have two different weights of, you know, two different stones is the way that it was described. You can't have two different size ephahs from which you measure grain. You are to have one, one, one stone and one ephah that is right, just, true, and friendly. You are to have one. Okay. Now, if you'll have one, then what you will have is you will be able to live long in the land that I give to you. Well, why? See, we've made that into some kind of a blessing or some kind of a reward. No, no. The reality is you will not introduce corruption into your financial system. And when you don't, in, when you don't introduce corruption into your, uh, into your financial system, this thing will hum like a top. It will just explode in productivity. You know, I've shared with you about, you know, one of the things I do is I build models because it helps me understand things. You know, if you took a dollar, you know, a dollar, if you put it into circulation and if you put it into wealth producing areas, that dollar will produce anywhere from three to five dollars all by itself. Just by keeping it going in in the system. Well, if you don't, what happens? 
you, when you introduce corruption, self-serving, you introduce different weights and measures in order to exploit and extract, what do you do? You introduce corruption, i.e. we call it cancer in the body. When that happens in the body, we call it cancer. We introduce cancer into the financial system. Well, what does it do? It eats you and itself. Yeah. And so you don't get to live long there. That's what we're seeing right now in our system. Our current system is built entirely on the premise of different weights and measures. There's no more evidence of that than the inflation as it relates to the Federal Reserve. And, you know, you think about this. If you think about this, you know, the debt from, for example, the Charlie 19 period, which was tremendous, right? The money printing was crazy. If you think about this, you know, the, the central bankers know, and this is since we got off the gold standard, they know that if they can't get the resources from taxation, that they can literally print more, which makes the products and services go up and they can receive it the opposite way. And it's, that's the theft, right? That's the legalized yep. theft of it. And you know, what's interesting is once you've committed and gone down this path of different weights and measures, and it, right now it's a sliding scale. Like we literally since 1913 have decided, all right, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to change the goalposts. We're going to have different weights and measures. And so in a way, this extraction process is a cancer that's eating us alive. Yes. It and is. it's amazing. But think about this. We're living in an age and anyone who is hearing us, we're living in this age where these systems not only are breaking, but there is an opportunity for us to to lead in his nature and character, to rule in his nature and character. This is like we have, this is the resetting of that and not from a globalist perspective, but literally from a decentralization perspective. Well, that's, that's exactly right. And the, and see what I would offer in that conversation is, is DeFi is, is the original way it was di- designed to set up, you know, to operate. You know, there was no centralization. What there was is there was an agreement on the weight of the stone and the size of the ephah. Yep. See, the weight of the stone that would be used to measure out a weight of, of whatever it might be, and then the ephah that measured out the amount of the grain. And everybody agreed that those would be the just, true, right, and friendly measurements by which everybody would function and operate. Well, the only part of that that was centralized was the agreement. Everything else was decentralized in its operation and function. Okay. So, okay. Now, if we're going to move into that direction, all right, folks, are we willing to say, okay, Jesus, how do you see the economic order functioning then? How do you actually see that operating? Will you show me how to do that beginning with me and then in my family and from my family and my attitude toward dealing with other folks? Can I actually learn to operate with a just, true, right, and friendly weights and measure? Now, that's just not money. That's in the way that you make decisions. That's in the way that you deal with other people. That's the way that you approach challenges and circumstances. It is an attitude of the heart that is being built into the nature and character of the Father. That's what it is. And so it's not limited to one area. It becomes an expression of the entirety of your life so that the will of God can be done where? On earth, how? As in heaven, and to what outcome? With no corruption. For the purpose of teaching man how to rule his creation with him in the fullness of his nature and character. And where does bless and protect come in? Bless and protect is, is, the, na- is the purpose for authority. Authority in the kingdom is for the purpose of blessing and protecting. It's not for the purpose of being, you know, being the guy who can tell everybody what to do. That's not its intention. Its intention is to bless and protect. And so authority is what is given somebody to, 
to enable them to accomplish the purpose and the role that God has given them to, has assigned to them in his kingdom. Okay? And it's an entirely different approach to authority. Okay? And we, I mean, we can go back in and out of all of these examples. I mean, let's look at this for just a second. How are we doing on time? We're good. We're good. Okay. Here's a fascinating thing. At least I think it is. Then others may not. That to me, I think it's fascinating. You, you've heard me share that if we, if we get this, this terrify, this is the kind of stuff that terrifies our spiritual foe. This terrifies him because he knows that we are all one decision away from moving out from outside of his control and directly into the control of Jesus. Now, what does that mean? That, in essence, is the first transfer. And when you transfer a person, you transfer not only who that person is, but the entirety of who they are and all that they possess and influence. So guess what happens? That mechanism of, of wealth production represented in the human being that is under the power of darkness, under the control of darkness, and to whom we have given our authority, is instantly extracted from his system into the system of the kingdom of God. Instantly. And Satan knows that that can happen in one single decision. Now multiply that times 7 billion. So... We look at this craziness that's going on in our in our country, for example. When I said this could be over in a month, I wasn't kidding. I wasn't, you know, blustering. I'm telling you, if that's how quickly this could change, and that's what terrifies them. So let's look at how this upside down thing works. I don't know if anybody has ever read, you know, the founding documents, you know, or, or if you have, if you haven't, I suggest that you do. But if you haven't, you know, uh, if you have, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. In the Declaration of Independence, it says that we are endowed with certain inalienable rights. Well, where did those inalienable rights come from? They came from our creator. What were those rights intended to accomplish? to fulfill the divine decree that we would rule the planet with him in the fullness of his nature and character. Those are the rights. That is the position. That is the operation of that very simple premise that we read in, uh, in Genesis 2. Okay? So, now, what did these people with inalienable rights do? They said, well, the reason we have governments is to protect our, these rights that are inalienable. And so when that government no longer serves that purpose, then it is not only the right, but it's the duty of those people to shed that government and start a new one. So what did they do? They created a government, and what was this government to be done? How did they construct it? Well, they, they, it, they constructed it under the framework of what we call the Constitution. Well, what does the Constitution say? We, the people. Now, that's an extension of the superior people in relationship to the government, now constructing a government based on certain authorities and certain purposes. Well, what was the purpose of this government that they were constructing? Well, there were six of them. I don't know if I can remember them all off the top of my head. The first one is to form a more perfect union. The second one was to establish justice. The third one was to ensure tranquility. I think the fourth one was to promote, uh, was the fourth one was to provide a common defense. I think the fifth one was to um, ensure tranquility, among, uh, what, excuse me, welfare, the general welfare. And I think the sixth one was to secure 
the blessings of liberty to us and to our posterity. Now think about that for a minute. And then sit back and look at the government that now operates on our behalf and say, how many of those six delineations is our government now performing? Well, they're not performing any of them because they have usurped the position over their creator. Yep. And now called their creator its subjects. Yep. Guess which well, guess what that's called? That's lawlessness. See? And so lawlessness is that cancer that is operating and functioning. That that's why this thing is blown apart at the seams. Because the toddler called the, called the U.S. government is now acting like it's ru ruling the house. And at some point, the parents are going to have to step up and say, kid, no more. And that's all it's going to take. No more. And in literally a month's time, this thing could be over and done. Okay. Now, how do you know? Well. Try it on for size. Yeah. See, look at your own house and the things. Now I'm going to pull this back into this may seem unre unrelated, but I'm going to pull it right back into our conversation yesterday with you and being picky. The government is being manipulated through spiritual forces to pick at the human, at the American population to irritate the fire out of us, to create division, dissension, all kinds of things in order to extract from us not only our authority, but more importantly, our resources. See? When the federal government says under the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, what are they declaring? That they at any time can reach into the American population and extract from them their wealth to support whatever commitment that the U.S. government decides it's going to make and any expenditure it's going to incur. Now, do we say, yeah, you can do that? No, that is the operation of a thief. Now, what was happening with you yesterday? You called me and said, hey, I'm being picked here. And what it's doing, it's wearing me out. It's annoying me. It's running me down. It's making me want to give up and roll over. It's doing all kinds of things. How do I deal with that? Well, Huh. And then this, then this morning, the Lord said to me, red herring. Well, okay, Matt, you're in the game, friend. So now, there are two parts of this. From heaven's point of view, this is a good thing. From human and Satan's point of view, this is, they're trying, you're trying to be exploited. So here's what you do, okay? You now know what a red herring is. You looked it up and you said, oh, red herring? Now you know what it looks like to you. Step back and say, okay, Jesus, what does red herring look like to you? And how am I to position myself with you in order to view this red herring in the way that you view it? Now, what happened to you the moment you started gaining his perspective on, on that situation? What began to happen to you, Matt? Well, I mean, as I continued to probe it, it became more obvious that it was more, it was clearly from him. But what's amazing is, I mean, this morning was the breakthrough of all breakthroughs. It was almost as if this was a, yeah. And that's the thing that really struck me was, it's almost the higher the stakes, the more the, more the trouble, right? The more the picking, the more the, the, the tension. And, you know, I hate to say I waited it out, but in a way, what a wonderful, you know, encouragement you provided, Ray provided, you know, it's like, Hey, we don't give up. We're not giving up. And of course that red herring became more and more obvious. Strangely enough, he brought to my attention a movie I had seen a couple of days prior and said, all right, these are how these things fit together. And then when I heard the stories that were told this morning, I realized, ah, 
this is why you say this, right? And it's it was a word of caution, but also, you know, if I'm going to make your path straight, we're going to make it straight. Do not, basically, that red herring, what is that? That is a distraction. That's deception. And this is a wild goose chase. This is going down a path that you don't need to go down. And, of course, wouldn't it be nice to know when the paths are not the right ones to go down? And that's really what he provided. And that's, you know, real insight. But what I love about it, it wasn't like a, yeah, it wasn't, you know, I don't know. It was, it was, it was uh, meaningful and certainly true. Now I'm going to, I'm going to let, if, I'm going to let the audience in on a little more of the details here, because one of the things that we have tried to, um, to do is to not just let these things be theoretical and, and fun little subjects to talk about, but actually look at how they function and operate in real life. And we've affectionately called it the 72 hour rule or the 24 to 48 hours kinds of things. And you just described something in less than 24 hours, yeah. how, how it functioned. <clears throat> okay. Now all of this is to illustrate when I talk about, this thing could be over in a month. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Okay, I'm giving an example now in, in just your experience yesterday. So what happened was, now some more details. Okay, well, what if I don't really know that this is Jesus saying red herring? What do I do then? So now let's get into some of, some of the mechanical elements of this for folks. Okay, well, once you get to the place where you are You've done everything you know to recognize or to come to the decision that this is what Jesus is saying to you. Then what you do is you say to him, Jesus, everything that I know to do to determine whether or not this is you has led me to the conclusion that this is you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to accept this entirely as your command and instruction. If I have somehow missed you, or misinterpreted, thank you for getting me realigned with you so that you get me where I need to be. And only you have the authority to do that and you do it the way that only you can do it. Thank you for letting me recognize it as you are making that adjustment. What are you doing? You are making a declaration. Then what you do is you go to the pickers, the ones that are picking at you, and you look at them and say, okay, thank you. You've done your job. Now it's time for you to shut your mouth. Be gone. Now, Matt, where did they go? Were they gone? This morning you woke up and said, whoa. Yeah. 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 And, and, and it, yeah, clarity. Okay. In, in a, in light speed, the entire dynamic of what was happening around you and the, and the intention, the adversarial attention against you and the pro intention for you, they came into collision and guess which one prevailed? Yeah. The one that was there to say, okay, Matt, you're in the game. It's time to go take the next step. This is how you do it. Yep. Wow. Well, we've we've often said, and this is the reminder. I mean, it's funny. I had that conversation with you, and then I had one with Ray. He was struggling with in the car. Hmm. And it was so neat to just pass this along, right? But what we were talking about was, well, no temptation has seized you. And I think about a seized up engine, one that doesn't move, right? It's yeah. trying to stop you in your tracks. Right on. And I was thinking, you know, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful, right? He will give you a way out. And I think about that as real direct instruction. What, it is, what did that provide? He's always going to provide you a way out. And I think that that's, there's real hope in that to say, I'm not giving up. I'm not letting you convince me of something I know to not be true. And it's hard, right? There are many people who have taken their own lives in these situations. People have been in, you know, they've been in, you know, terrible depression. I've had incredible anxiety. You know, I still challenged with it. And, 
you know, you start thinking in, in those terms and that's why I'm seeing all of these things as we're swimming amongst this barrage, right? And many people have been taken out of the game, yeah. right? Been rendered ineffective, have been seized. Yeah. And what's so amazing about it is our friendship and relationships that we have is this constant reminder of who he is, how he speaks, that he is alive, is unceasing. It, yeah. it basically helps, you know, get you unstuck. Yes. And I would say you don't realize, you know, I, I was listening to Jordan Peterson and, and Oliver Anthony. And, you know, there's so few people who are willing to and they don't see their interactions with people and their attitude and their words as being carrying much weight. And, you know, we have this epidemic right now with men and a lot of these guys are in crypto. Yeah. Who have never had a man or never had a coach, never had a guide or haven't recently or could count on one hand when somebody actually said, you matter, you're valuable, there's a purpose to your life and not all is lost. Because this world is basically saying to you, you might as well give up. Yeah. And all of this stuff that we're swimming in, and it's amazing how we need each other. And the word became flesh. Yeah. His name is Steve, right? Or whatever your name is. And I think yes. about that idea of this daily, you, without me, you can do nothing, right? I'm the vine and you're the branches. Hold on a second. So you say, I can do nothing without you, but with you, I can be the word becoming flesh for someone else. Yes. Meaning this is, you know, and that's where I see, you know, this, this idea that we can help one another up and it's really helpful but I think that what's so pure about your approach, Steve, is that you're always constantly pointing back to the source. You're saying, hey, I'm going to help you. I'm going to be encouraging to you. I'm here to listen to you. But I'm always going to remind you. And you even said this so well with prayer. It's not that I'll pray for you. It's that I will encourage you to pray to the one who has the solution. Yeah. And I love that because you're always pointing them back to Jesus. And if you think about it, every time I look up, every time I look to him, all of these other things fall away. And like you said, you know, it's just, it, they're gone and you go, okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, you think about this, like to really wrap all this stuff up and try to put a bow on it is what does it mean to lead in his and rule in his nature and character? And I was thinking about that. Well, that's a pretty lofty vision. Could I pull that off, Steve? Maybe not on my own. Right. Cause if I go on my own, I'm not connected to the, the vine. But to think that we end up becoming kind of this conduit, right, where in which he flows through us and people see that, right? Well, what is his nature and character? It's extended in partnership with his man. He made us so that we would partner with him and be him in the world, right? Ruling in his nature and character. And to think about what if we were to lead in his nature and character and in our authority, bless and protect those? What if that was the way in which we approach things? Well, I might not say the same things on social media. I might treat my wife differently. I might see my children differently. Yes. I may interact with people differently. I may lead my business differently. Yes. You know, and I think about the model that Jesus was. And you know, you we we often talk about this moment in which Jesus washes the feet of the disciples. And it's such a picture, right? You're like, "Hold on, you're the God of all creation that all things were made for you and by you and you're the ones in the smelliest position of washing the feet of the disciples." But you know what's amazing is, you know, I've read the book by Jim Collins called Built to Last and, and Good to Great. And he's a secular guy doing research on these great companies. And you know what he found was that the people that were leading these com companies were leading as servants and they were people of faith. And he was like, why is it that all of these great companies I run into are led by people who have this deep faith in basically recognizing their role in the context of creation? And I think about this and I go, well, what if we had a, a, a group of men in crypto? And, and what would it look like? And I'm going to tell you, I feel like the opportunities are just waiting for you. Whatever they may be designed exactly the way they're made for you, if you're willing to rule and do and align yourself with the very creation and say, I want to lead and I'm interested in you showing me how to lead in your nature and character because he has given you authority. And so many of the men that are in crypto... It's like, you're not alone. You're not alone. We all, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. 
Yeah. And, and that's the thing. And that's why I'm so thankful for this community. It's messy as a lot of things are, but yeah, if it just starts with us, you know, I, I look back at the scriptures and I was always been fascinated by this idea that somebody was saved, right. In, in mm -hmm. that, you know, not in the transactional way, but that it was also he and his household. Yeah. I'm really fascinated yeah. about yeah. what does that say? It says yeah. that these things overflow into the places of authority. Yes. And that this has reverberations that affect all of those under the authority of one who aligns himself with the nature and character of the creation. And I, I just, it's a beautiful thing. And it's, you know, what is the product, the byproduct of it? It's not a bunch of money. The byproduct is rest and peace. And, you know, there's, there's also the mystery of storing up treasures in heaven too, that I don't exactly know what it looks like, but it looks like there is a, there is something to well done, good and faithful servant. So, Steve, I'll tell you what, this is, um, all of this is transformational because it points to, and why it resonates so much is because it is true and yeah. you can probe it. Yeah. And that's the thing I think is great is, that, you know, I don't want to bash the church. What I want to say is Jesus is alive and he speaks. And you know what's so funny about this? I was thinking about who are the people that, where have I heard that before, Steve? Where have I heard that before? I feel like I've heard that before. You know where I've heard that be for, before from? Where? O old people. Old people. <laughs> you know why? No, no. I think about my grandmother. Yeah. She said he's always been enough. Yeah. Why? Because she was talking with him and walking with him. Yes. This isn't, um, this isn't new. No. No. This isn't new at all. But you know what's interesting is? I think about the mature people that I know. They're not the most boastful. They're not the ones that are screaming you know, gluing their feet to the pavement. They're the ones that are saying, no, listen to him. I walk with him and I talk with him. And it's amazing, actually, how we get back to some of the things that are at the very, very core origin that I say old people because I feel like they are those are the ones who have done the crab walking yeah, and have walked with him. And, you know, what's interesting is a lot of the church infrastructure is, you know, built by young people. But it's amazing when you run into people who have actually dealt with some of these things in life and they're like, you know what? He's always been enough. He's there, right? And that's the thing, you know, this idea of Jesus is alive and he speaks. And I think that that one concept alone, you think about changing the very nature of the church, what would it look like if you went to a place that somebody said to you, the creator of all things is available in the moment by moment. And... You know, I think it would be refreshing if somebody said to me or to you, hey, what's Jesus saying to you? And yeah. genuinely were interested. Yeah. They were genuinely interested. What's he saying to you? What's that yeah. look like? And, you know, I think about how much the church has been neutered. I remember a pastor telling me one time that there was a new family that came into the church and, you know, they were really nice people and very humble people. And it wasn't but for like five years that these people sat in the pews. And finally, after, you know, a big mega church, finally got to know these people. And this man who was in this family had translated the Bible in like five African languages. Wow. And they never knew it. Never knew it at all. Oh, yeah, this is what I do. And it was with the Wycliffe, I, I believe. And it's like sitting in your midst are people who are listening to the living Jesus. Yes. What would it look like if we actually talked about what he's saying? Yes. Right on. Right and on. what if we actually fanned the flame of that passion in people's hearts to say, no, he is alive, not just on Easter Sunday. Yeah. And that's the thing that is amazing to me is what are all the connections that could be made between those who are listening to Jesus and each other? Yeah. And in a way we've set up barriers to say, no, shut up and sit down. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I thank we'll, you for this you. time. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. So once again, Steve, we have accomplished <laughs> our, our goal of, of two hours of content. So we are up to actually, I think, 45 hours now. But um, what, a, what a joy. What a joy to do this, you know, in this format. Because I, I just every time I think about it, I'm like, when I'm older, somebody's going to watch this. <laughs> And I'm going to be thankful for that. Um, any last thoughts or comments, Steve, before we head off? 
No, just just thanks again, Matt, and uh, for everybody who takes the time, because I know it's not easy to carve out two hours, whether you're listening to it live or, you know, in pieces or, you know, on the replays afterwards. It, it requires a commitment, and, and that's the whole point of it, right? I mean, it's the... It's the simplest thing there is. It could not be any more simple. And every single one of us get a chance to try it on for size just simply because we're interested. It's yep. no more complicated than that. And that's the profound nature of it all. Yeah, I want to bring this comment. I love this. NT Fryer, thank you so much for this comment. It's great listening to these conversations, but as a Catholic, it's frustrating. We may not have as much of an emphasis on the Bible, but I know Jesus is alive every time I, I receive the Eucharist. You know what's amazing about that? And I just right. want to I just want to say thank you so much for saying that. Yeah. What you're experiencing between Steve and I is this shedding. Steve shed a lot of these layers, right? Because he, you know, everybody's been raised and taught in a certain way. And you, you think about this. You couldn't be more right. What is this? And, and my brother is Catholic. And, you know, I remember going to mass with him and messing up what they were saying because I didn't know what to say. And, you know, I've always frustrated with this idea of like, well, yeah, priests and middlemen and, and Eucharist. And really, is this actually Jesus's? But what you're, you're making an, an, an exceptional point is that in all of these different models and all of these different methods, we have tried to create things that are institutional in nature and they pale in comparison to the living Jesus. And I think we try in our, in our own ways to fabricate things that will constantly remind us of this fact, but we, we insert one thing for another. And I think what is so inspiring to me about you know the shedding that i've done talking to steve is this constant awareness of holding each thought captive to the living speaking jesus and whatever that takes whatever that reminder is and to have that engagement is you know we got to remind ourselves of that and if that if you're reminded of that when you do the eucharist knock yourself out we could have a ton of conversations about that but I think at the core of this, it's a discussion about saying, you know what, um, this is real. And, the, and you would say the same thing. It's real. And the question is, it doesn't manifest itself in a building. It manifests itself in each of our hearts. And I think that that's the, the beauty of it, is that it's real power. It's real authority. It's real, it's real stuff. And it's, and it's a tree that's proven by its fruit. And so I just thank you for bringing that up. And I agree with you, not in its practice, but in its function. Ultimately, we've got to constantly remind people that Jesus is alive and he speaks. I mean, what a, what a great comment, um, Matt, because that, that is the essence. Jesus is alive. Well, kind of going back to last week's deal, okay, if Jesus is alive, what does that actually mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, take it outside of any kind of a religious construct. Yeah. Um, just simply, what does that mean? I mean, if he's alive, does he do something different than I do when I am alive? I'm alive. What do I do? What do people do with me? How do... What, what does that mean? Does somebody take in my life and completely designed and constructed a framework around which other people have to relate to me? What, what does it mean to be alive? And because to me, he, uh, NT Fryer, is that, yeah. was that the handle? Yeah. yeah. I mean, man, you've hit a bullseye there. Yeah. Is Jesus is alive. And okay, what does that actually mean? when somebody is alive, you know? I mean, Jesus dealt with that very thing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? The, the Pharisees say there's a resurrection and the Sadducees said there is no res resurrection. 
And Jesus's simple answer is, is God, you know, God is a God of the living, not the dead. So when you're a God of the living, what do you do? Well, last week we talked about the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, Jesus, you know, conferring with Moses and Elijah, right? That, that's what living beings do. They confer, they talk, they engage, they, they have work that they, that they um, are accomplishing. Well, and that's that you're right. That implication of his being alive. Yeah. And, you know, you think about the extent by which he, you know, he didn't just disappear. He reappeared and let them put their fingers in his side. And what yeah. I love about it is actually post resurrection, these experiences. And then literally, you know, we have this this moment where he he gives <laughs> us this guidance in charge. Right. It's amazing how he just didn't just disappear. No. And, and that's what's so awesome about the hope that I have in all of this is that when you really dive into this and understand the, the length and extent of not only the sacrifice, but of what followed it as very practical means by which we live in him. And I think about that as it relates to Pentecost and the Spirit, right? This idea, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send one who reminds you of everything I said. Oh, my gosh. So not an, besides you accomplishing all of this, you're also going to decentralize the very nature of our communications. And you're going to remind me. And, you know, I think about that. And then we're going to put things in place to remind you some more. We've gotten away from, and it's almost like we've, you know, what do they say? You've forgotten your first love. Well, what is that first love if not the living Jesus? Yeah. And to think that NT Fryer, my experience as a Catholic outside the importance of the sacraments, has always been about living relationship with Christ. And that's exactly its purpose, right? Yeah. What is the purpose yeah. of us going back to these things and being reminded of them? You said that. Well, well who's the Sabbath for? Yeah. This con why all these, you know, uh, festivals and why all of these things as a reminder to us to say, Jesus is alive and he speaks. And it's so powerful because that's the thing, you know, as we see others, you know, like you, N.T. Fryer, a brother in Christ, what does it mean to be one who is in Christ, but one who is listening to the very words of the living Jesus himself? And what are the implications of that for wherever you are and whatever authority you have and whatever family and situation you have? And what would it look like if we decided we are going to, we are going to rule in his nature and character? Dang, that sounds really exciting. And it sounds right. And yeah. you know, and I'm experiencing that as well. And it just as a teaser for all of you who care about crypto, what's coming from all of this is will knock your socks off, right, Steve? You know some of what's happening. I think so. I, I believe so. Yes. <laughs> it is unreal what he is doing. And so I'm just so excited about being able to share that with with everyone in the future. But Steve, thanks so much for your time today. Um, have a great weekend. You as well. And thank you for the comments, NT. Yes, absolutely. Yes. All right. I'll catch you in a minute. Okay, man. All right. Once again, you have spent two hours and 15 minutes with Steve Staggs, a professional. And you know what? I mentioned they asked him about the, the best baseball player of all time. And it was really to, to give him a compliment. You are seeing a professional in action. He's applying and has applied. And this is the way the Lord made him, right? To apply the very nature of a professional attitude and practice to this idea of what does it mean to engage with Jesus moment by moment and to think that the depths of this are ultimately unsearchable, right? Th there's no bottom to this thing and that we can continue to do it. And to see someone who is willing to take their time and to invest it in someone like me or you to do this, it says so much because what it says is I value this i value this so much that it's important to share it and that's really what i want to do that's why do i do this why do i carve out fridays to do this is because this is meaningful stuff that is you know where is life life isn't in money it's not about when lambo but to think that all of these things could be accomplished as we align ourselves with the very nature of his character is is just it's absolutely tremendous. And I jokingly say, we, he's cut us in on the deal, man. We got the cheat codes. But you know what? That is real life. He's trying to show us and tell us, hey, this is the way. So let's not drive 
backwards on a one way street. Let's let's get in line and let's um let's see the the product and the fruit uh, of this labor. He he meant for us to carry the ark, and he wanted to partner with his man. And so as we build the man, right? I'm trying to do that daily, and Steve has been extremely helpful. I hope it's helpful to you. Take care of yourself, and we will catch you next time. Take care, everybody.